Hi, everybody. When you paint a man a fish, he has a painting of a fish. When you teach a man to paint a fish, he has a hobby for a lifetime. Today, we taught grisaille and glazing of fish. And it was a great fun time with the Austin Palette Club. See you next time. Hi. Seat, ladies. My name's Arnica. I've brought both an acrylic and an oil painting today. Has anybody here ever painted with the grisaille and transparency glazing method before? Very good. Yes? Well, if not, then I will be first demonstrating how I got to this point in oils. And then since to have a glazing effect, the painting has to be dry, I'll take my acrylic and glaze on it in acrylic. So then you'll get to see a little bit of both processes, oil and acrylic. I have up here both my setups in oil and acrylic. This is my palette for oil at home. I always work with a structured palette, meaning my colors always go in the same place every time. That way I know where they are when I go to look for them and I don't have to spend 10 minutes every day going, where's my black today? Because I know where it is, it's always right there. So this, these are the colors I have used so far in this painting. It's one color, that color being Van Dyke brown and white. I make what is known as a color string, which is a variety of that color in variations of tone. Tone would be the value of light to dark. So I'm going to make that color string first here for you today again, because I'm going to recreate this guy up here with the two colors I used before. If you go out painting anywhere, you might want to take with you a pair of pliers. They're very handy for opening tubes of paint. I can't use your teeth. Oh, yeah, you can. You might lose your teeth if you use your teeth, but you can. And is this the acrylic painting you're starting with? This, I'm starting with oil, and actually this is an alkyd oil, which dries in about 24 to 36 hours instead of one week to six months, which is why I prefer the alkyd oil. And I have the, this is an itty bitty little travel set for my paints I use sometimes when I go out painting in the wild, so to speak. And this is my bigger French easel that can carry more materials. I thought I'd bring a whole bunch of everything so y'all could see what I used in various situations. So I think the idea is to see a working artist work and things in process might be interesting or materials, methods. So this, who's ever done color string method before? Ray and her, yes, very good. So color string, you start with your darkest color. In this case is a Van Dyke brown. Whew. You squeeze it out onto your palette. Generally want to mix with what is known as a painting knife. I use a very small one. So that I can use smaller amounts of paint. I don't like being too wasteful, so I use a small painting knife to mix. Starting with my Van Dyke Brown, I'll take some of it off to the side to start my color string. And I know I'm going to have about five strings. And I'll add a little bit of white to that one I just set off to the side. So I get slightly lighter tone. This is important because in representational painting, this is not an abstract painting, although it is an abstraction of a fish. It does represent a fish. In representational painting, the way to get three-dimensionality is through having variation in light and dark. In order to do that, value is very important. And so making a grisaille like this, or a one-color black and white or brown and white in this case painting, will help you see what value things are next to each other before you get the complication of color on top of that. And there is some color in here. It's brown, right? But it's not three, four, five, six different colors you have to think about. You're just trying to make the picture read, first of all. 
And to make it read as three-dimensional, you have to have the light and dark. So I've got almost dark enough. You notice I'm taking the dark and taking it over to the light paint instead of putting light paint into my dark. That's because dark paint tends to be extremely powerful in its tinting effect. I'm tinting the white paint with the dark paint and not trying to lighten the dark paint with the white paint because if I tried to lighten the dark with the white, I'd have a pile the size of Mount Everest and it still wouldn't be light enough. So when I get down to this last little string over here, I'm not even taking any from there. I'm just going to take that little blob that was already in there. That'll probably be dark enough for that last little string. Just a little hint of color. <clears throat> that hint of color is what I use to tone my canvas. I tone most of my canvases. This canvas and this canvas both have a background tone of burnt, uh, sorry, uh, Van Dyke brown and white on them. And that's just so that you don't have pure white shining through anywhere you might have missed painting later on when you're done with the painting. So in this guy, you can see there's still some of that Van Dyke brown white underpainting shining through him. But it doesn't look weird because it's in harmony with the whole painting. I've used this color to make the background color and it looks harmonious now. One of the little tricks of painting is first you have your toned canvas. Then I did a drawing first in pencil and then I went over the pencil with a brush with just this Van Dyke Brown thinned down with mineral spirits in this case or water in the case of acrylic. So far these are the only colors I've used for either of these paintings. Now they look different. Manufacturers of paints will mix up their colors differently. They get their pigments from different sources. So this manufacturer of my alkyd colors used a more, see, reddish orange pigment in the Van Dyke Brown mixture. And this manufacturer of my acrylic colors used less of it. And that's the difference, different manufacturers. But it's the same name on the <laughs> tube. So you should know your tubes, know your paints. Once you get a tube, learn what it does. Use the whole tube so you're used to it. Don't go out and buy a different brand of that same color and think it'll be the exact same. Test it out first because it might be a little different even though it's got the same name on it. So fish are a great subject matter for transparencies and they're often also used for watercolor demonstrations because watercolors are known for their transparency. This grisaille method is also known for transparency which is why I'm using fish once again even though it's not watercolor. Watercolor works on layering and glazes sometimes, uh, washes, different colors of washes on top of each other. In uh, oil, it'll be glazes. This is a glaze medium I've got in here. Um, I brought the bottle. I use this liquid glaze natural so that it is non-toxic and I'm not breathing any nasty fumes. So I don't have to be afraid of painting in my own home. So that's what I use for the glazes in oil or just to thin the paint in this case. I always dip my brush into my thinner, whatever it happens to be, before taking it over to the paint and then pull out a little bit of paint to make it, you know, just move a little better. Oil paint is known for being very hard to move around. All right, fish time. Always start with the darkest darks, in this case his eyeball is probably the darkest thing here. I like to see, which is why I brought this example. This is what I would put my reference on in the home studio. little music stand. So that I can have both. Whoa. There we go. Stay. That's because the music stand knocked it over. Okay. No problem. So I can have my reference and my image right next to each other. Because surprisingly, if this were somewhere I could not see the two together, just turning my head, I'd kind of forget exactly what it was I was looking at. I always carry these in my pocket because invariably there's going to be a smudge somewhere I didn't want and then I can wipe it off. So need lots of paper towels. Always have lots of paper towels on hand. 
I also use them to clean my brushes in between colors. So I'll set down some paper towels to wipe my brushes on. Is that a paper towel in your pocket? That's a paper towel in my pocket. <laughs> this is Viva, Viva cloth paper towels. I, I find they're really great. They're really the best. Um, don't skimp on your paper towels. They're really helps to have a good one. This other side here I have oil. It's walnut oil. And were I to need to clean my brush mid-session, instead of using stinky turpentine, what I do is first I wipe off what's on there onto a paper towel, dip it in my walnut oil, which is what Rembrandt used for all his painting, by the way. It's a drying oil, like linseed oil. And that gets most of the color off, and then I'm ready for a new color. I don't have to smell turpentine in my, in my home. So I've got oil there for cleaning the brush. I've got glaze there for thinning the paint. Back to painting the fish. Generally in oils, we start with the darkest colors first, and you exaggerate them a little bit. And it's not too magical. It's just it goes just like you would think. I just kind of put it down there, one brush stroke at a time, just like you would do at home in your own studio with your friends here painting at the palette club. But you do kind of have to just guess where would I want it to be darkest. And you're looking at the fish along the top of him is very dark. Turn this way a little bit. Okay, I have a question. Yes. But the fish in the, in the photo looks kind of bluish. That's right. But you're just doing the value faces and the tone on tone colors. Yes. Okay. A grisaille is a one color sketch, either black and white or brown and white or blue and white or purple and white or whatever and white you want, so that you can see what's dark and what's light in your painting before you go put the clear layers of color on top, which would be the glaze. And people talk about um, old master technique. Well, which old masters? There were a lot of old masters. But I think generally what they're talking about <clears throat> is this glazing technique, where you have an underpainting, a grisaille, showing your values, and then on top of that, they come back in and glaze the colors on top. And that's what a lot of the uh, Dutch and Flemish old masters did with their works in order to get that three-dimensional effect that glazing and uh, grisaille, the value change, will give you three-dimensionality. So I've almost got all those darks, dark darks. And at the end, sometimes you'll go back and restate your darks. You said it once, you say it again at the end. But most of the very darks are in there. Maybe he's a little bit down this way too, doesn't he? Yeah. Okay. He's starting to have some form to him now. And I'm going to change my brush. This is a flat brush. It's got a flat top to it and it's got long bristles. There are also filbert brushes which kind of have a rounded top to them. I'm going to move to a filbert. I find it moves the paint for me really well on rounded forms like fish. I'm going to go into my next color in that color string, that medium brown. And I think it might be a little too light yet so I'm going to bring some off and add a little dark to it. A little glaze to help it move. It's a pretty standard method used by painters is this color string method where you build up layer on layer. Oh, I forgot a little bit of fin up here. This fin will have a little dark around it too. There we go. That's better. 
Now we're getting a second layer of dark. Slightly lighter, less transparent. Onto the fish, around his belly. Just to give him some form. Form is modeled with lights and darks. That is how you get your forms in representational painting, is through the juxtaposition of light against dark. Like on this fish, we see that that gill of his is popping forward because it's got very dark against very light there. That's how we know that it comes forward. It's that juxtaposition of very dark <coughs> and very light. So I'm going to restate that dark around the back side of his gill there. He's putting some color on the fish. Okay. And painting is a simplification. It's always going to be simpler than the drawing. It's going to be simpler than the object itself. And the genius of Picasso, though many people don't like him, was his realization that painting is a simplification to the point where he was drawing a bull using one line and it just became the horns of the bull and the testicles of the bull, what makes a bull a bull. But we still know it's a bull, even though it's that simplified. And painting is a simplification. In this case, we're just simplifying that drawing a little bit. Yay, fish. Once again, I'm exaggerating the darks because painting goes in layers. Almost never will you have a one-layer painting unless a sign painter made it. But in fine arts, generally, paintings are built up in layers. And so we exaggerate the darks and then add light on top of them, layer by layer, to get that traditional painting look that people talk about. You know, oh, that painting is... The old master technique, okay, yes, it's the layered effect that they're really looking at. And so now you know. you got to just add a little more dark than you really want and come back and adjust it again later. Layer upon layer. That's probably enough of this color. I would then move into the next layer. Which would be this third one here in the color string. Get a little bit of that glaze medium. Pick up some color. And it will overlap on top of some of that light that I did already. Especially here. When you're putting wet paint on wet paint, if you attack the canvas like this, you'll just be blending the two colors together. If you put the brush down like this, then it will put it down when you're perpendicular to the canvas. It'll actually lay it down on top more than blend. So it's how you hold your brush and attack the canvas will make the difference in that case. So wet on wet technique is fun. You get to do a lot of fun things with it. If you can figure out how to get the paint to stick to wet paint, which I just showed you. So I hope you enjoy that when you go back to paint on your own. Starting to put some lights on the face of the fish. Fish face. And some over here on the tail. And I'm already moving into my fourth light color, so that means we're, oh, four fifths of the way done with this fish already? Well, that was fast. It can go pretty fast if you're prepared. The drawing took a long time. Like I said before, Drawing is measuring. You didn't want to watch me stand here and measure all day. Painting is magic, so I thought I'd bring the magic to you instead. <laughs> Did save the measuring for home. But most representational paintings do have an underlying structure to them, and that structure is brought about from that measurement from the initial drawing and layout. Design elements are important. I've got three fish in this painting. That's a design and composition element. We like things in odd numbers for some reason as humans. 
one, two, three. It makes us think of, oh, I don't know, a happy family of fish, right? So for design purposes, I've got the canvas separated into thirds with three fish. That was intentional. I've also got some movement happening in these fish. I'm controlling the viewer's eye. This fish is going up to this fish. He's looking at his tail and he's chasing him all the way up to here. And then we go back to him. So I'm hoping that you can follow the progression of my fish in the painting. And that's the composition side of it. I compose these fish deliberately to be chasing each other around the canvas. More fun that way. Have some fun little fish, fun friends swimming along together. Now he's got some real light around his eye. And around his nose. In the example here, I've got his face very pale, even though that's paler than I really would have him be, because I know that I'm coming back on top with color, and that'll make it a little bit darker. So I had to exaggerate the lightness in this case, because the color will add a little more darkness when I put the glaze on later. Hello, fish. So I'm just adding that light right on top of the dark. Very traditional, very standard way to work. You just put the light right on top. Lay it right in there. And you get a fish. A little light on his tail. And that's how you would make a grisaille painting of a fish. The very end, I've got this lightest light that I made. Oh, I don't know, maybe his cheek down here is the lightest area. Holding my brush once again kind of parallel to the picture plane. It puts it down more than mixes it. Little light areas up there near the front of the fish. Yeah, that's pretty good for now. It's just an example of how you can paint a grisaille. I would then, for the last step in a grisaille, go back and restate my darks. I said it once, I'm going to say it again. A little more dark on the tail, say. Some finer lines up in there. A little more dark up here under that fin. That's pretty good. He's a good little fish. I'll stop there. You can come and look at my materials and whatnot, and then I'll move over to the acrylic glaze next step. Yep. Welcome, Austin Painting Club. Welcome back. So now we're going to do the glazing portion of the grisaille and glaze technique. I'll be using acrylics on this one. This is a slow dry blending gel that I'll be using for the glaze in the acrylic. It helps you be able to move things around for longer before they dry. Also I have this retarder gel that will also help your acrylics not dry instantly on your painting or your brushes. If you have trouble with your acrylics drying too fast, these help a lot. Also, yes, this is specifically just a retarder. This, you add one drop to your pile of paint and that's all you need. It does not extend the paint film at all. So if you water down your paint too much, the paint film might still break if you use just a retarder. If you want a very transparent but strong paint film, then you would use the glaze or any um, of the mediums, the glazing mediums, the blending mediums. A medium has that binding agent in it that will hold the paint to your canvas and to the other layers that doesn't flake off when you brush up against it later. If you thin your paints too much, they might not stick to the canvas or your prior layers. So that's why the glaze for glazing. Does that change the color? No, it's transparent when it dries completely, completely clear when it dries. Uh, these are my paints. This is a golden open acrylic that already has the retarding medium in it. So it's called open because it can stay in the open longer without drying out on you. And also 
old Holland. These do not have a retarder in them, but these, their claim to fame is that they don't have a color shift. Uh, who's painted in acrylics before? Yeah, yeah. And when it dries, who's had their painting dry darker than it was when you put it down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these apparently, their claim is that they do not do that, or maybe not as badly as most others do. So those are the paints I use. I put out for my coloring of the fish today a little bit of the light yellow, yellow oxide, or uh, what do you call that, yellow ochre, uh, burnt sienna, quinacridone magenta, and this is anthraquinone blue. Uh, it's a substitute for ultramarine blue. It's very similar. Um, more transparent. Since we're doing glazes, transparency, right? Glazes tend to be very see-through. This palette here is a Masterson's Stay Wet -a palette. It's got this paper on top and a sponge underneath. You put water down on the sponge and it helps your paint stay wet. So I've got all kinds of tricks for my for my acrylics to keep them from drying out before I get to use them because that's the worst thing. You mix up some nice paint and it's just the perfect color. Where, where did you buy that? That's Jerry's Art Arama. Uh -huh. yeah. Yep, they have these in the store. Okay. And you can see that I, these are, this is my color string that I made last night for this grisaille. Same thing, dark and then five different shades to get the values on the fish, but just in acrylic instead of oils. I put some glazing medium down there. I do like to mix my colors with a painting knife because then I don't get my brushes all clogged up with paint and it doesn't ruin the brushes quite as fast. So we are going to put that blue on the fish now. Yes, they're still wet. They'll stay wet for about a week with the palette. Yeah, it's got a cover to it. So it's like Tupperware. And it keeps it moist for up, up to a week, really. So I save a lot of paint that way. That's why I can manage to buy the good paint, because I waste less. So the whole container comes with the wet sponge. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the paper that goes on top of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, it comes as a little kit they've got there. Okay. Yeah. So, blue and orange tend to make brown. And there is a little bit of orange color in that fish, but not a lot. So I'm just going to try plain blue on top of him right now. To start getting that blue up in there. And see if it'll turn a little towards the greeny side like he has on his body. And it's lighter in color because that's the glaze medium. The glaze medium is kind of white. When it dries, it will then go darker. But we're just adding a little color. Seems a little too blue. So I'll add a little bit of the Van Dyke Brown to it to make it a little greener. A little greener with the Van Dyke Brown in it. We'll put that on there and see how that feels. And that's the process of painting. You just try it and see what happens. It's just painting. You're just playing around with puddles, you know. Don't stress. Just have fun. <laughs> Make a little puddle, see what it does. Oh, that's fun. Happy fish. Happy fish, exactly. <laughs> yes. I'm just swimming in the water. If I had brought my uh, blow dryer we'd be able to see what color that really did turn into more quickly. Next time I'll bring my blow dryer. And his blue also is kind of along here. A little bit. So, so you did the value in, um, oh no, no, this is something else. This was an acrylic version I did last okay. night so that I could do okay. the glazing on top today. I could try also to glaze in the oils. I believe that my oil from last night is probably dry enough to glaze over since I used the alkids. So we've got some good blue on there now. He's looking much more fishy. 
And glazing can be very quick, pretty simple. You've already got the drawing on there. You can still see it through the glaze. And now he's blue. There's a little bit of orange around his nose and along his belly. So I've got this little, uh, this is actually often used for cleaning your brushes and oils and people would put turpentine in there. But it's got a little um, thing with holes in the bottom. So you wipe your brush off, but this is water. I use it for my acrylics, just to clean the brush. So I don't necessarily want that blue into the yellow glazes because then it'd just be a green glaze. And once again, lots of napkins. Always helpful. Put some here. Oh, I got it. Yeah. Pat out my brush so that it's checking to make sure it's clean and dry. Put my palette down. Clean my knife. Do you usually prime your brushes before you start painting with them if they're dry? Yes. <clears throat> what do you use for primer? On your oil and your acrylic both? I will use whatever I'm thinning my paint with that day. <laughs> if I'm thinning my paint with water and acrylic, I'll prime them with water. If I'm thinning my paint with a glaze, I'll use the glaze. Uh, in this case, it was so glazy, <clears throat> just went right into the glaze. Straight up in there. <laughs> So yeah, and then the oils I showed you, I dipped in the glaze medium first, took it over to the paint. But this time I'm taking the glaze medium to the paint first over on the palette. Little glaze medium. Uh, we'll do that orangey brown, just a little bit of color. I'm using a little burnt sienna. It might just be burnt sienna all by itself. Let's see how that goes. It's a pretty color, burnt sienna. Very useful. Can make pinks if you put white in it. Very lovely pink color. All right, we'll try some orange on the fish around his little face. It's kind of brownie orange, but I'm going to put the orange down first because he's already got brown up there. Uh, not quite orange enough. I'm going to put some yellow in. That's just how it goes. You try something and see how it works and go, oh, okay. Maybe it needs a little yellow instead. Yeah, sure. That looks better. And he's got that over there. Oh, yes, yes. The colors really do sing. Hello, says the fish. <laughs> and on his tail, back over here. I added that extra white on the tail so that whenever I did come back with the glaze, it would really show up. Because the glaze needs the light underneath it to shine. It needs to shine through the glaze. There's lots of different ways to do optical mixing of colors. One of them is by putting them next to each other and that gives you a vibratory color like the Impressionist did. Or another way is to put them on top of each other and that gives you this other effect. The glazing. Hey fish. I like its little I'll put some around here too, just because I like the idea of the color moving all the way around the fish. And it's my painting, so I can do that. <laughs> He's got a little bit along that stripe too, so I'll add it up in there, because I think that'll look pretty. And it does. It does look pretty. And you can do that with your painting. You can just decide, oh, I think I want this to go all the way around. Okay. Well, now it does. His eye is very colorful, so I'm going to go back and get some more intense color into the glaze of that burnt sienna. More pigment, less glaze. Maybe even a little of the bright yellow. So you can really shine that eye. Is glaze actually shiny? It, it can be. There are a lot of different mediums. Some of them are uh, gloss mediums. Some of them are uh, matte medium, so it depends on what kind you use. I'm actually putting a little red in that eye too, just because I think it'll look nice there. And a little brown. Keeping that light dark variation. Don't want to lose our values. 
a little brown in there, bringing back the values. So I said it once, I'm going to say it again. I'm adding a little, this is alizarin crimson, or no, in this case it's quinacridone magenta, made to simulate alizarin crimson, which people stopped using. Alizarin crimson is what's known as a fugitive pigment. It means it fades. It fades in ultraviolet light. So they changed to quidacridone magenta instead from it. Yeah, I don't like that there. Okay. And just a real light glaze of color over the rest of the fish, I think. Just to make them look swimmy. Is that a, is that a word, swimmy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> swimmy. He looks pretty swimmy. Maybe a little more pink around his gill. Well, I'm ready to go paint fish. How about yeah. you? Yeah! <laughs> Be sure and order a white wine. White wine. <laughs> to go with your fish, yes. I am going to do a final touch of dark. I'm going to restate my darks even in the glaze up in here just to make sure they do stay dark for me. So I'm using that darkest dark uh, Van Dyke Brown and the Anthroquinone Blue to make kind of a greenish blue, very dark, just to make sure he stays fishy. Those dark spots. Restate it. Oh, got off the edge. Fingers work great. They're good tools. Don't eschew your fingers or chew them. <laughs> That's pretty much the glazing technique. Lickety split. I can do it for you in oil next. So now we're going to glaze in oil. And same thing, I'm going to have a glazing medium. Because especially in oil, if you thin down your paint with turpentine or odorless mineral spirits, to where it's thin enough to see through, then you've broken your paint film. And it's not going to necessarily stick to the layer underneath it. In oil, you must paint from thin to thick, from lean to fat. This glaze is made with linseed oil. It's basically pure fat with a chemical additive to alkalize it so that it reacts with the oxygen faster and dries faster. Because oil doesn't dry through evaporation, it dries through oxidation. So the alkyd additive helps oxidize it faster, which is why it is dry sooner. But you have to have some material to stick your pigment to lower layers of paint. In this case, it'll be my lovely glaze. And since this glaze is thinner than the other glaze, I'm going to just try and go in it with my brush. Hopefully I don't ruin my brush, but I'm going to dip it in the glaze first and then take it over to the color. In this case, it's ultramarine blue, uh, cadmium yellow light, yellow ochre, and uh, quinacridone magenta. Very similar colors, the same color string from before. I'm going to take my ultramarine. I didn't have an anthroquinone in oil. That's okay. It's close enough. Are you using a bristle brush or another type? This is a nylon brush. All these brushes come together in a set. They're not expensive. It's about $10. There are three bristles, two nylons, and one sable in that set. The sable's that little bitty guy. I'll use it for details or for drawing. Like that drawing was done with that little bitty sable in there. The bristle brushes I'll use for like the background or for sketching out whenever I don't have fine detail to worry about, or for pushing thick paint around. But the nylon bristles, these nylon, the soft brushes, they're good for the upper layers of your painting and for smooth passages, like glazes. Good question, thank you. Jerry's? Um, online, yeah. They might have them at Jerry's. The brand is Princeton. They're, they're a value brand. I, I try to go for value things because I want the people that I work with to be able to afford their materials. <laughs> it's important. If you can't afford to paint, you never get to paint, right? So it's okay. Use the less expensive. I'm adding a little bit of that um, Van Dyke Brown just to make it a little greener because I learned on my first fish straight blue didn't work just right. 
I like the blue brown of the mixture so I'm just gonna start with what I knew worked in the other one and start putting that color on Ooh, a little dark but that's okay and dry. dry enough, <laughs> dry enough. Okay. it's it's um it's kind of sticky but it, it won't come up it'll it'll stay where it's at whenever I glaze over uh, last night, last night at uh, about 8.30, <laughs> I was preparing. See, I'm prepared. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> Be prepared, exactly. That's a pretty good blue glaze for that guy. I like that. That works out fairly well. No, this is oil, just like I did there. I took a little more time on the bottom fish because I didn't have an audience when I was painting it last night. I think I probably took about 45 minutes instead of 12. <laughs> so he looks a little better down here than his counterpart above him. We won't tell the guy above him. <laughs> You're beautiful just the way you are. We love you. So I'm just, you know, adding a little more glaze for a finer touch of blue down there. Really very little color, mostly glaze. So I'm going to spread that around. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm going to add some white also. I want to keep that shine in there. And so the value change is really what shows us what's on top. Hey. Oh, that's pretty good blue. He's got a little blue around there, doesn't he? Need a little blue around there. Stick it on. Maybe a little blue up in here. A little blue way right there. Where else? Anywhere? Probably, but that'll do for now, I think. Yeah. And same as the last time, we'll go into the, uh, what was it, burnt sienna next. So to clean my brush, I squeeze out what paint's in there onto a napkin. Got to have lots of napkins. Paper towels are great. You can use rags, but since they uh, have been known to burst into flames, I've never had any do that, but I've heard it might happen. I use these guys, and then I can get rid of them in the trash. They go away. Don't ever worry about them again. Dip it in my walnut oil to get it thoroughly clean, because I don't want blue in my yellow, because it'll just go green, as you know. And wipe it off again. That's clean enough for anybody's business. Now I'll go into the glazing medium. Where's that burnt sienna? Oh, forgot to put it out. Go grab some. There it is. Now I got it. Uh -oh. <sighs> Typically, a person should hold their brushes there if you're going to paint with your brushes in your palette in your arm. I don't usually paint like this unless I'm demonstrating. I'll usually put my, my palette on a table. I find it easier, but for now, this works. Oh, look at that. That kind of looks pretty, doesn't it? Okay. Back to where I was, getting my burnt sienna. And I've still got my, my paints laid out where they would be any day of the week, no matter what. That's where I kind of where I put them. Even if I don't have all the colors, my greens would go there, but I'm not doing green today, so there's no green there. It's just a blank spot. Taking a little bit of that burnt umber in the glaze medium. The color of the fish face. Ooh, around his nose is pretty orange, isn't it? Yeah, some color up on there. Fish lips, oh! <laughs> Maybe a little yellow in the fish lips, what do you think? <laughs> He's a pouty fish. Yeah. Pouty fish. Mm -hmm. Yes, and very orange around the eye. So a little more burnt sienna, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. 
And a little red. We put a little red in the other guy's eye. Let me put him on here too. Yep. And thin it down even more. Less pigment, more medium. The stuff you thin your paint with is called medium in any kind of paint. You've got acrylic medium, you've got oil medium, but it's all medium. It's not the pigment, it's the medium. More medium. And what is the medium of your This medium, well, there are many different mediums to choose from. I have been using liquid glaze natural throughout this whole thing. I have used nothing else but the liquid glaze natural medium. You can use a combination of turpentine, Damar varnish, and linseed oil, which smells a lot, and the turpentine is not necessarily the best thing for your nervous system. So, turpenoid works. Um, better yet is Gamsol, which is highly refined. Turpenoid still has some volatile organic compounds that can cause uh, nerve problems and kidney disease. So uh, if you use mineral spirits, Gamsol, highly refined, is about the only thing you want to use in a closed environment without some ventilation. Just, just be careful. <laughs> Don't make yourself ill while painting. It's supposed to be fun, not supposed to be hazardous to your health. Once again, I'm going to take this orange around the body of the fish because I just like the way that looks. All the way back. A little bit under there. A little bit of orange up on the gill there. And maybe on the tail. I just want to remark on the um, fish <laughs> on, on the far canvas. It, it looks 3, 3D. Well, good. That's. That was the goal of the exercise to sh is to show you that the dimensionality does not come from the color. The dimensionality comes from the value, the dark to light. It's all about reading the darks and lights. I'm putting a little dark back into that fishtail now. I'm restating my darks again. I said it once, I say it again. And maybe want a little green in there after all. So I'm going to add a little yellow to that blue. Make it a little greener. So I see maybe there's a little green up in here. Right along there. Yeah. A little green up in there. So just like Bob Ross. Happy fish. And he really was a boon to America. He brought so much joy to so many people. He's a great, great man. An Atlantic sardine, freshly caught. Nice pink gills still. They're really pretty and delicious. <laughs> you good? Okay. So I'm going to take some of that red now. Magenta, quinacridone magenta, to pink up his gills for us. Really like that in the eye. Any other pinks on him? Maybe around the fin? Just for fun. This guy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah up there looks good. I agree with you. And that top fin needs to get darkened. Put him on there. And we'll restate the darks around the eye. Gotta have your darks to see the light. Ooh, I lost a little bit of the eye. That can happen. Oil paint's very forgiving. You just go back in and la la la. <laughs> there you go. Now I got it back. Once again, napkins. Gotta have your napkins. So cute little fish. Some little spots on his side. 
And I will have the last layer be the light layer. That's generally the way it goes with painting in opaque pigments. The light goes on last, a little shine on his belly, very white, right? Dark to light, thin to thick, lean to fat. These are all things I say over and over again in all my classes. I just repeat myself because they're important things. Transparent to opaque, and then transparent again if you like. You can glaze over it, and then you can put opaque on top of that. Push it back and forth, have fun either way. That's one way to paint grisaille and glazing. So glad you guys came to watch me. Thank you. <laughs>